I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 18, 7-10 The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. And then there was an earthquake. As if coronavirus wasn't enough, the shaking caused damage in various places along the Wasatch Front. Luke 21.11 and there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. The 5.7 magnitude Tembler hit this morning at 7.09, centered near Magna. We have live team coverage this afternoon. Fox 13's Adam Herbetz is covering an earthquake-related chemical leak at the Kennecott Smelter. Sydney Glenn is at the Red Cross Evacuation Center at Taylorsville High School, and Ben Winslow is following how state and local leaders are responding. But we begin with Lauren Steinbrecher on Main Street in Magna, where there is damage to some of those systems historic buildings, Lauren. Yeah, Bob and Kelly, I mean, and this is an area that was pretty close to the epicenter, one of the towns closest to the epicenter. You can see, I mean, the entire street here, Magna Main Street, is completely blocked off right now, and you can see some of that damage spanning across the entire sidewalk. No surprise with all of these historic buildings that they would crumble so easily. All along Magna's main street, pieces of brick and debris have crumbled to the ground. The building's too unsafe to go inside. The heart of this town is shut down for who knows how long. My first thought is get down here and see what's going on. Those who own these historic early 1900s buildings knew the shaking wouldn't end well. Unified Fire says they evacuated more than a dozen buildings in a six block section of Main Street after the quake hit. Thankfully, no one hurt. Some buildings and businesses are worse off than others. Everything in our lives is this, this restaurant and uh, it's just like getting kicked in the face when we're down. For the restaurants and bars, which already closed because of COVID-19, this is yet another crisis. It was emotional, you know, because we don't know if we have the means to come back. County workers and the fire department walked building to building, really taking a full look at the scope of the damage as the owners wait to see how much the damage will cost them. Now, one thing that happened just this evening, they went door to door putting notices up. You can see on the Copper Miner Saloon, uh, one of the bars here on Main Street, a red notice saying that building is unsafe to enter. Next door, there's a green piece of paper on the front and green next door to that. So they've gone door to door saying what's okay to go in and what's not okay to go in. So now, of course, figures out uh, how much is it going to take and how long is it going to take to get back to normal here. Isaiah 24, 19 through 21. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. It shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. You know, some of the older homes in Salt Lake City began to crumble during the aftershocks of the earthquake. Fox 13's Erin Cox continues our team coverage this evening. She joins us live from Westminster Avenue with a look at the damage there. Erin. 
That's right, Kelly. The owners of this house say it was originally built in 1892. It fared pretty well in that first 5.7 magnitude house uh, magnitude earthquake. But as you can see here, after that aftershock around 1 p.m., the exterior began to crumble. Behind the blossoms blooming and in between the branches, you can see the old brick on Craig Walker's home crumbling. It's too too soon to know right now. It's just sort of surreal. You know, it's it's your home, but you know, you hate to see it like this. Craig and Lance bought the house in August of 2019. It's 1892. It was built by Sesame Sears. And have been fixing it up ever since. Until the house began to shake. Kind of shook me awake, and then I could realize the light fixtures, there's a lot of old light fixtures that were hanging, um, were shaking. They were able to make it out safe, but the 5.7 magnitude earthquake was just the beginning. It kind of rolled and it knocked me down. I fell down the stairs and kind of cut up my hands a little bit. The 4.6 magnitude aftershock is what pulled down the old brick. We've had a couple of engineers come by just to say, hey, stay out. And Craig wonders if they'll ever be able to repair the damages to a home he loves. Grateful, he says, that's all he's lost because of the earthquake. Several people in West Valley City woke up in their own homes for possibly the last time today. Several mobile homes were destroyed at Western Estates near 7148 West Arabian Way in West Valley. Fox 13 Sydney Glenn spoke with some of the people whose homes were damaged. Sydney, what did they have to say? Well, as you can imagine, they're upset. A really tough morning for a lot of people. Crews still out here right now trying to fix what they can. Dozens of people without a home tonight. You know what they say. Life can change in an instant. It felt like like the ground actually dropped out from underneath me and it was a big boom. The 5.7 magnitude earthquake did more than shake these trailers. It shook the people who call these home. It threw me up, kind of up in the air and my wife grabbed me and screamed and all I gotta do is put her under me and wait for everything to stop. Take a look around this house. There's nothing left on the walls. The Tuno's belongings scattered across the floor. Our cupboards are all open. There's food all over. But they consider themselves some of the lucky ones. These pink signs now keeping people out of their homes. These guys, their house is condemned. The one next to me, their foundation is busted in the back. But through this trying time comes something beautiful. People helping people. You know, I told her, if need be, call me if there's stuff that you need. It makes you have faith in humanity. And while the shaking hasn't stopped yet. I've been feeling them all day and <laughs> it's just a nerving thing. This community isn't letting their loyalty for each other change one bit. Everyone does have a place to sleep tonight. Taylorsville High School is now being used as a temporary shelter. Of course, the of course, COVID-19 still on everyone's mind. A volunteer there tells me they are screening everyone for symptoms before they're allowed inside. Plus, they've disinfected everything and they're making sure everyone stays at least six feet apart. There are five earthquakes that occurred during the seven year tribulation, three of which are called great earthquakes. The largest and final earthquake to ever rattle planet Earth takes place during the last half of the seven year tribulation, as we read in Revelation 16, 17 through 20. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God, to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, 
The pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. The Lord Jesus foretold that there would be plagues or pestilences in various places in the last days before he returns, as we read in Luke 21.11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. From Italy tonight, the most staggering toll yet. 475 deaths in just the last 24 hours. And again, this happened in a country with a severe lockdown, with more doctors and beds per capita per person than here in the U.S. And tonight, Italians recording messages to send out to the world their warning. Here's ABC's Maggie Ruley. Tonight, Italy staggering as the virus rages. 475 more deaths in 24 hours, the most in a single day. The death toll approaching China's, but Italy with just a fraction of the population. New video inside an ICU unit in the hardest hit part of Italy shows doctors fighting a relentless battle, working endless hours. One physician confiding, there are so many patients, there is no time for tears. A governor warning that soon they will not be able to help new victims of the virus amid an acute shortage of equipment. The rates of infection are being watched closely by the White House's Coronavirus Task Force. We're very interested in the curves in Italy because of their different approach and we're following every single country's curves. Italy's different approach is a tougher nationwide crackdown on public life than in the U.S. 8,000 people have already been cited in just one day for breaking the rules, and violations can result in jail time. And a warning for the United States. Italian filmmakers spreading the message of act now through an emotional video that shows quarantined Italians sharing what they would have told themselves to prepare 10 days ago. Stay at home. And with London having the most and fastest growing number of cases in the UK, there are now new reports of a so-called shielding plan for the city that would essentially lock it down and contain it from the rest of the country. Now, David, the government has not confirmed these plans, but it seems like right now all options are on the table. Secretary of State Pompeo called out Iran, where more people have contracted the virus than anywhere else in the Middle East. I also want to call attention to the Iranian regime's misinformation campaign surrounding the origination of the Wuhan virus. Instead of focusing on the needs of the Iranian people and accepting genuine offers of support, senior Iranians lied about the Wuhan virus outbreak for weeks. They know the truth. The Wuhan virus is a killer and the Iranian regime is an accomplice. Iran's delay helped spread the virus throughout the region. From Iran, there are people that have gone to Iraq or the Gulf. In all those areas, some of them have brought back the virus. Pompeo's criticism came after Iranian officials warned millions could die in the Islamic Republic if Iranians don't follow health guidelines. Pompeo said America would help. We continue to offer assistance to Iran in numerous ways, and we will continue to do so. We have an open humanitarian channel to facilitate legitimate transactions, even while ensuring our maximum pressure campaign denies terrorist money. Yet one top Iranian religious leader called for the spread of the coronavirus to speed up the return of the Shiite Messiah called the Mahdi. Some Shiites believe the Mahdi, also known as the 12th Imam, will return during a time of great upheaval in the earth. Here in Israel, the health ministry issued drastic new guidelines to help stop the spread of the virus. Residents have been told not to leave home unless it is absolutely necessary. People must avoid parks, playgrounds, and other public places, and social interaction should be carried out remotely. This comes after the government closed all restaurants, theaters, cafes, schools, and universities. In these desperate times, some organizations, like these volunteers from the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, are delivering food to Holocaust survivors. The economy continues to take a big hit from the coronavirus pandemic. Wall Street riding a roller coaster today after the Dow plunged at opening, temporarily erasing yesterday's gains. Joining us now is financial expert Dan Celia to talk more about the virus's economic impact. And Dan, tell us which businesses and companies are really going to be hit the hardest. 
uh, probably hotels, motels, restaurants. They're going to be the first to start seeing a series of bankruptcies uh, followed by the airline industry. In all likelihood, Boeing's going to be very much at risk as well. Uh, some industrial uh, businesses, and I'm not even uh, talking about all the small businesses that uh, could go away. The other thing, uh, interesting, Wendy, nobody's talking about oil, the oil sector getting hit very, very hard. Demand for gasoline down dramatically right now. People aren't driving. They're not, go they're not going anywhere. So now we have uh, domestic gasoline uh, down significantly. And that's there's so many issues here, and the government needs to dramatically step in. Dan, will Trump's proposed checks, I'm hearing it's up to $2,000 per adult, uh, will that really make up for some of the people being temporarily out of work? No, uh, it's, it's not going to do that. It's, it's going to help. And there are a lot of people that uh, that is going to be critically important that they receive that. So I don't want to take anything away from that. But look, it is not going to be a, a stimulus in the economy at all, number one. And it's not going to help those people that this is probably going to be long term, Wendy. This isn't going to be over in the next month or so. And uh, they would have to supply checks like that every month to some people. I think the payroll tax holiday, that would be far more significant. But of course, that's assuming that people are working and we are going to see unemployment go up dramatically. Dan, what's expected to happen in the stock market? I know that's uh, not easy to get your crystal ball out there, but you know, over the next two weeks that are considered crucial to the spread of the virus, what do you think the market will do in the next two weeks? The market's going to continue to decline. Uh, there may be some days of stabilization uh, where the volume might be a little bit lower. But look, it's, still, it's going to continue to go down. It doesn't mean that it's not going to come back up and come back up strong. But the question is, when's that going to be? And it's not going to be for quite some time, it looks like. I mean, we could go into next year uh, on this. And there are so many issues that have to be thought about from elections uh, on that could be even more concerning to the markets. This was a black swan event. It was unpredictable, but nonetheless, it is having this dramatic impact. And what we all said, myself included, this is a temporary event. Well, the temporary, it is a temporary event. It's not going to be here forever, but I think the government's going to have to take some very drastic steps. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we start to see some very serious confinement of everybody for an extended period of time of 30 days or so, which obviously would have a bigger uh, impact on the economy, but probably lead to a long-term, a quicker recovery. In the last days, the Bible gives a warning to the rich who oppress the laborers, as we read in James 5, 1 through 6. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. As businesses are closing across the country to stop the spread of the coronavirus, the administration is proposing up to $1 trillion in aid to help those affected by the shutdown. The plan includes sending checks directly to Americans. Americans need cash now, and the president wants to get cash now. And I mean now in the next two weeks. Mnuchin now warning the unemployment rate could hit 20 percent if the government does not step in. More than 7 million jobs are now at risk. At risk restaurants and bars across the country. In the travel industry, nearly 5 million jobs at risk, with hotel chains planning to follow thousands of workers. 
The relief plan also includes $500 billion in a payroll tax cut, $50 billion for the airline industry, and $250 billion for small business loans. With this invisible enemy, we don't want airlines going out of business. We don't want people losing their jobs or not having money to live when they were doing very well just four weeks ago. It comes as the virus has now spread to all 50 states, and more than 100 Americans have died. We're asking the young people to help us with this mitigation strategy by staying out of the bars, staying out of the restaurants, really trying to distance yourself. At least 22 states activating the National Guard and more than three dozen states have canceled public schools. Healthcare workers are bracing for a surge in patients and a shortage of medical supplies. The Pentagon now providing 5 million respirator masks and 2,000 ventilators to health and human services in response to the outbreak. The Defense Department is also making its 14 certified coronavirus testing labs available to test non-DOD personnel. The Navy is raiding two hospital ships for possible deployment to assist with patients who don't have the virus, freeing up valuable hospital beds. Meanwhile, Border Patrol will return to Mexico all immigrants entering the U.S. illegally, with the administration saying it cannot risk allowing the coronavirus to spread through detention facilities and beyond. President Trump Trump says the U.S. is on a wartime footing in the fight against coronavirus. Today, he announced he's invoking the Defense Production Act, which will ramp up output of essential equipment. And the roller coaster economy taking another major hit, once again triggering a halt in trading. But we begin with the decision to close the U.S.-Canadian border to all non-essential traffic. This does not include essential travel or the transit of goods, but it was through mutual discussion that took place this morning between the President and Prime Minister Trudeau and uh, the Department of Homeland Security will be effectuating uh, that decision. Latest numbers show 7,600 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the U.S compared to 600 in Canada. The leaders of both countries saying this decision to close the border is a necessary one. Travelers will no longer be permitted to cross the border for recreation and tourism. During Wednesday's task force briefing, new information about the potential effect of this disease on young people who had been thought to be at a lower risk. There are concerning reports coming out of France and Italy about some young people getting seriously ill and very seriously ill in the ICUs. There may be disproportional number of infections among that group. And so even if it's a rare occurrence, it may be seen more frequently in that group and be evident now. The president also invoking the Defense Production Act, which allows him to require production from certain industries in response to a national emergency, such as much needed ventilators. And FEMA, known for responding to natural disasters, now operating at a level one, its highest level, to help fight the virus. Now, this is a very different kind of a work for FEMA, but uh, they will come through as they always do. The Navy is preparing to send two hospital ships to New York and Seattle to handle overflow. Each ship can treat up to 1,000 patients. Meanwhile, flight operations at Chicago's Midway Airport are limited. Hundreds of flights canceled after at least three technicians in air traffic control tested positive for COVID-19, as did four Brooklyn Nets players, including Kevin Durant, a disease the president referred to this way. The Chinese virus, it's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China, that's why, it comes from China. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Well, in the midst of so much uncertainty, faith leaders are encouraging people to turn to God. In an op-ed for USA Today, Tony Perkins, an ordained Southern Baptist pastor and president of the Family Research Council, talks about the onslaught of coronavirus coverage and the anxiety that it that can take hold. But Perkins points to a God who answers prayers. And this scripture, James 5:16, uh, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Tony Perkins joins us now live for more on all of this. And Tony, with so much going on right now and being said, 
What role does prayer play in stopping this virus? Well, for, for believers, it's an essential role. And, and uh, Paul in, to the Philippians says that we're to be anxious for nothing. It's kind of hard not to be anxious right now. Anytime you turn on the news or pick up a newspaper, the headlines scream out at you, crisis. But the scripture says that we're to be anxious for nothing, but by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known unto God. And I think I'm hearing it as I talk to pastors across the country. There is a, a move back to prayer, especially as uh, many churches are not able to meet and we're kind of working with the White House and working with officials to try to, to, to come up with creative ideas for churches to be able to meet. But this is a time where no matter where you are, where you're by yourself uh, or with uh, a group under the size of 10, you can pray and pray and ask that God would intervene uh, in this virus, in this plague that's moving around the globe. Tony, Vice President Pence, he was criticized a while back for, you know, praying about the coronavirus with, with the people around him, and there was a photo that was going around. What did you make of those criticisms? Well, look, there's, there's always been those who mock uh, prayer, who mock religion. But let the mockers mock, but let the people pray. Uh, this is a serious time. In fact, I sent a letter last week to the president last Wednesday night uh, asking that he call a national day of prayer along with some other uh, evangelical leaders and the president immediately said, yes, we need to do that. And of course, this past Sunday, uh, he called the nation to pray. And, and so this is a time for prayer, prayer for our leaders. I was uh, talking with uh, uh, some members of the president's team today uh, in the White House, just encouraging them, letting them know that we were praying for them and the president. And that encourages them to know that we are praying for them because these issues, these challenges are bigger than what we can handle ourselves. And we need divine direction and we need divine intervention. Yeah, divine intervention is definitely the call of order here. And in your op-ed, you talk about tracking the casualty numbers and confirmed cases in real time and how that is creating anxiety. Now, you talked just a few moments ago about being anxious for nothing. How can we calm all those fears? Well, again, it, it's prayer. And the scripture, Paul writes to Timothy saying that we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind and of love. And, and, and the way we arrive at that is through prayer, because if we're anxious, we can't have a sound mind. And we, we, we don't need to be fearful. Yes, there are uncertain times here. We don't know where this is going. In fact, that's a big challenge here. This is an unknown. We don't know how this virus is going to mutate, what it might become next, but we don't have to be overwhelmed with anxiety, especially for believers right now. This is an opportunity for us to trust God. Yes, it's going to be difficult. No one said it was not, but we know that God is, and I use I don't like to use this phrase because sometimes it's used flippantly, but God is ultimately in control. And for believers who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, look, what awaits us in eternity in the presence of the Lord far exceeds what we have here on this earth. And now we, we want to solve this problem. We want to make sure that people are get the health care that they need. But we can only do that if we think rationally. We operate with a sound mind. The only way we do that is we trust the Lord and we do that by prayer. Uh, Tony, we would love it if you if you could offer a prayer for our audience tonight. But first, before we get to that, if, you, if there's just something that you might offer to our audience, advice on handling all of this and all of the uncertainty that they're facing, what would that piece of advice be? Well, one would be listen to the, the, the instructions coming down from the White House, from the CDC. They're, they're on top of this trying to do the very best they can. We need to work with them. I trust what this administration is doing. But we need to, especially parents, I'm going to say this as a parent of five children, your children are looking to you. And if you're anxious, if you're spending too much time watching the headlines, you know, turn the TV off, turn the radio off, open the Bible, pray, share that with your children. Your calming presence will have a huge impact upon your children. Tony, we've got about 30 seconds left. Would you be so kind as to offer a prayer for us right now? I'd be happy to. Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers and we lift up this nation to you right now, beginning with our president and his team. Give them great wisdom in the decisions they must make, Lord, the weight that they carry for the American people. Help them. And Father, I pray for the sick. Touch their bodies. Raise them up. And Lord, we do ask that you would intervene and stop this 
virus, spare this nation. Lord, we look to you. We're calling upon you in Jesus' name. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In verses 25 and 31 through 34, Jesus continues, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Those passages make it clear that the Lord wants us to put our faith in Him alone. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in You. Psalm 39, 7. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.